Thank you very much. Hopefully you can all hear me. Great, perfect. So I'm a structural engineer, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how engineers contribute to the built environment, what our role is, and then if you're lucky, we'll manage to get this working without falling down, which it has done a couple of times. So as I said, I'm Roma Agrawal. I work for an engineering and design consultancy called WSP Group. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter there. I've got a website as well. If you've got any questions about engineering or anything, please do get in touch. Please come in, have a seat. No? <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about my background first. I grew up in India where girls loved maths and physics and it was all very normal. We all studied together with the boys and it was all great. Um, I moved to the UK to do my A-levels. I did maths, further maths, physics, and design technology. I was in a girls' school, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. But no one said to me at that time, you've got the perfect A-levels for engineering. It was just one of those things. No one thought to tell me that. That would be a good idea. So I thought, hmm, I quite like physics. I enjoy maths. Let me do a physics degree. And a bit of research showed me that actually with a physics degree, you can have a huge wide range of careers after that. So I did physics. Then one summer, I did a work engineering, uh, a work placement with an engineering company, but my job was really, really boring. So what I had to do was to go around the entire physics department of my university and log where all the smoke detectors were and put them on a drawing. Not the most exciting work, but what I did find out was I was sitting with all these amazing engineers that were designing particle accelerators at CERN so I don't know if you've heard of the Higgs boson that was recently discovered, but they were basically designing the equipment that would detect that. So really exciting stuff. And then that's when it hit me. I didn't want to be a banker or a lawyer or an accountant. I wanted to do something technical and something real, and engineering was the answer for me. So what do structural engineers do? Has anyone, put your hands up here if you have any idea what a structural engineer might do. One, is that it? A few? Great, okay. So if you look up at the roof, the reason the roof is not falling down on your head right now is because a structural engineer has done the calculations to make sure that it's all safe. So whether there's wind on there or snow on there, whatever happens, that structure is gonna be safe because someone like me has done some calculations to make sure that that's gonna be the case. So we do that for strength, so that's making sure buildings stand up but we also do it um, for stability. So if you imagine, I worked on the Shard in London. It's a very tall building. If you imagine all the wind load hitting it, like we had a big storm a few weeks ago, that building moves. They have to move, right? But we have to make sure that the amount it moves is safe and also that you don't feel it. So that's kind of part of our job as well, is dealing with dynamics. And that's kind of where this bridge is gonna come in. So that's what I do. I want you to think a little bit about your typical day. So you wake up in the morning, you're in your house, and as I said, your house doesn't fall on your head because an engineer has designed it. You get up, you have a shower, you brush your teeth, you've got clean water coming in that's safe for you to drink, and then where does that water go? How does that water get to you? Then you go to have breakfast, you've got fresh food there to eat. How did that food get harvested? How did it get transported? And how did it get onto your table? And finally, you might get into your car, your bus, or train to make your way to your office or your school. And again, who has designed that train? Why is that working? Where did all of the machinery come from? Why does it run the way it does? And my point is that engineering is behind every single thing that we live with. Every man-made object, your clothes, your glasses, your iPhones and iPads, none of that is possible without engineers. And so I think it's my job to go and tell everyone how wonderful engineering is and try and get more people involved and interested in it because you really are changing the way we live. The other point is that engineering is a very forward-thinking profession. If you think about the biggest challenges that humanity faces today, you know, we have a power problem, we've got too many people on the planet, how are we gonna give them houses, how are we gonna get clean water to them, and so on, you know, energy, and it's all of it is gonna be solved by engineers. So really, our jobs is to take a problem, break it down, and try and solve it. 
So if you're interested in any one of these sorts of topics and really trying to help improve the way people live their lives, then engineering is a fantastic thing to get involved in. So if I can get everyone here to close their eyes for a moment, and I want you, with your eyes closed, and I'm watching you, eyes are open, to imagine an engineer. Picture an engineer in your head. Okay, does everyone have a picture? Right, you're allowed to open your eyes now. So how many of you pictured someone like that? That's wrong. These are all terrible stereotypes that we need to get rid of. So the sad fact is that a lot of engineers are white and male. But there are people like me, I'm an engineer, that can come in and break that stereotype. And so we're working hard to try and change that. So next time somebody says to you, picture an engineer, won't you think of me? <laughs> Does anyone know who that is? That's a photograph from the Olympics opening ceremony. Anyone? Brunel, absolutely. So his name is Eisenbard Kingdom Brunel. He is one of the most famous British civil engineers um, that was there way back in the sort of 1800s, really changing the way the British people live their lives. And some examples of his projects, so that's the suspension bridge in Bristol, which is an absolutely beautiful piece of structure. He also got his hands dirty with shipbuilding, which is really interesting. And he also designed a tunnel to go under the Thames. And these are all things that were built over 150 years ago, and they're still all standing there. So you're really leaving behind a legacy. And I know that if I ever have grandchildren, I can take them to the Shard and say that grandma had a part to play in that. It's a really exciting thing to be able to say. Very, very rewarding. So some pictures, this is a picture of my office. So as you can see, we're all a very happy bunch of people. We're sitting around our computers. We, did, we do use computers quite a lot to do mathematics, to do our modeling, to do put 3D images together and so on. And we also do spend a bit of time on site because I'm in the construction industry. But I really, really love going on site. A lot of people think, oh, site is terrible. And it is terrible in the winter, it's freezing cold. So I stay away from site in the winter and it's all fine. But in the summer, you can do that, you can, well, we can do that. We went to the top of the Shard, that's the very top le um, level of the Shard, and that's a very, very proud team of engineers because we've already achieved something. And I think that's the best bit about it being an engineer, is the satisfaction you get at the end of the day when you've got this amazing project to say, I helped change the skyline of London. So, let's come onto this bridge now. Does anyone know what resonance is? Anyone doing GCSC or A-level physics? Maths, mechanics, no? Okay, so resonance is to do with vibration, is to do with swinging, okay? We call it a dynamic effect. So if you imagine, really simple picture, when you were a little kid, when you sat on a swing, what happens? You start to push yourself forward and backwards, and you go in a very steady time, okay? And then if your parents or your brother and sister comes and pushes you on the swing, what happens? you go higher and higher. So resonance is to do with the fact that when you've got this steady swing going on, if somebody comes and pushes you at the same beat that you're already swinging in, then the amplitude becomes larger, you swing further. Every single object in the world has got a natural frequency. So sometimes if you're on the bus or a car, you can hear something vibrating when the when the driver is driving at a particular speed, for example, that's because something's resonating. It's starting to really vibrate quite a lot. And structures do this. So as I mentioned, we have to make sure that structures don't fall down, but we also need to make sure that they don't resonate. So I'm gonna try and demonstrate a bit of resonance with the Jelly Baby Bridge. And I need, I didn't have time to finish my bridge off, so I need a couple, can I have two volunteers please to just help me put the last bits of the bridge together? Yeah, can I have one of you? Can I have any of younger people from the audience? Yeah, come in. But you're not allowed to eat them because we might not have enough then. So yeah, if you just skewer them onto the ends of the sticks. So can I leave that with you? Great. So what I've got here 
is some duct tape. You kind of open it up. I've lost the end. So uh, all of you can try this at home. You just open it up like that, lay it flat on a table, and then you get some kebab skewers that look a bit like that. And you start to lay them out on this piece of duct tape. So you've got your duct tape, and then you can put all your skewers out like that. And then I've put a second piece of duct tape over the top just so you don't get your fingers stuck on it. And that's the basic basis of the bridge. So that kind of works quite well. You can see kind of waves moving up and down it. But what really adds to the beauty of the bridge are the jelly babies. So how are we getting on here? Nearly done? Excellent. How many have you eaten? None? Good. Yet. Ooh. Fantastic. Can we have a round of applause for our volunteers? Thank you very much. Thank you. So what we can demonstrate here is if you imagine that this is a bridge, of course it looks exactly like one, we're going to make it resonate. Okay, so if I just give it a little flick, you're going to get a wave kind of going across it. And if I keep flicking it, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can even set it off kind of from the side. So can you imagine what might happen if a bridge actually started doing that? Not so great for the structure? Probably not. So just to show you that again, just remember what that looks like. Have any of you heard of the wobbly bridge in London, the one at the Millennium that was a bit wobbly? So what happened on that one was that as people walked, the way they walk is a, is a particular speed and a frequency. And on the, on the wobbly bridge, what happened was it, it actually started to vibrate sideways. So that's a slightly unusual thing to happen. We're more used to things going up and down. We're more used to things creating waves like that in a sine wave, if any of you have learned that in maths yet. But yes, yeah, so the wobbly bridge, what happened was it started to move side to side, and that's what caused the big problems with that bridge. And then they fixed it by basically trying to stop that. So as structural engineers, it is also our job to put these kind of bridges in computer models and try and work out what the natural frequency of the bridge is, and then make sure that that natural frequency does not tie in to people walking, to people running, or indeed to the wind. Because what I've got here is a video where a bridge, there was a kind of a gale, there was, it wasn't even a typhoon speed wind. So this bridge is from the 1940s when it collapsed. It's called the Tacoma Narrows in Washington in the US. And you can see that effect. So this is a real bridge. So that's doing exactly what I was showing you here. And that's what happens when it becomes too much. So that's not something we want happening to our bridges. And again, as I said, that's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. It's a really, really interesting job you try and think about how we stop that from happening, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing. So that's a little bit about the Jelly Baby Bridge. So I want to think a little bit about what are the tools that we're using in order to do our engineering design? What do I, what do I need? What skills do I need as an engineer to be good at my job? So maths and science is obvious. We need to be pretty good at it. You don't need to be a genius or people have this idea that all engineers are geniuses. I had a 16-year-old girl come in for work experience, and after the week she'd spent with us, I said, how did you find it? What was your expectation? And she said, well, I expected everybody to be standing around spouting out difficult maths equations all day. That's not what we do. We're all normal people. I think I'm pretty normal, just about. 
So, maths and science, creativity, why is it creative? In my mind, creativity is about solving problems in new and exciting ways, doing things in a different way, things that have never been done before. And I think engineering really gives us that opportunity. So there's a statistic which shows that in 2004, there was the top 10 jobs that you wanted to, you could do. And then there was a new list done in 2013, and the list is completely different. So you're doing your degree and you're being trained, but you don't actually know what the new problems, new technology is gonna be in the next 10 years. And what we're taught is how to learn, is you learn how to think, how to solve problems, break things down. And I think that that's called creativity. We work a lot with people. I'm the kind of person that gets bored very easily. I can't sit at a computer and just work away all day. I have to be surrounded by lots of people and engineering gives me that opportunity. So I don't know if any of you heard the architects talk before us, but we work with architects all the time to decide how buildings should look and how they get put together and it's, it's great teamwork. And I think in the UK we have a little problem with the awareness about engineers. So when I first asked you how many of you know what engineers are, I had only two or three hands going up. So hopefully, after today, if anybody asks you that question again, all of you know at least what a structural engineer does. So how do you come into a career in engineering? So I've put down a few different options. You could do an engineering degree. That's what a lot of people do. It's a very common way of doing it. You can do a degree in three years or four years. So that's pretty straightforward. You could do a science degree, so like me, you could study physics first and then change your mind later and I did a one year MSc in engineering and I became an engineer after that. And so it didn't actually take me any longer than it would if you did an engineering degree. You could do an apprenticeship. There's so much focus at the moment about apprenticeships, they're so important and it really gives you an opportunity to, when you're 16, get into the workplace get stuck into work, understand whether you like it or not, and you can even study for a degree part-time if that's what you want to do. So that's another fantastic way of doing it. I've also talked about the technician route, because yes, we're engineers that put things together, we design things, we do the maths, but who are the people that actually do the drawings, the 3D models, the computer work? They're the technicians. And so if you're interested in, you love visualizing things, drawing things, sketching, putting things together, that's a great way to get involved in the industry if you're not so strong with your maths and physics and not really crazy about it. So there's all these different ways and these are, these are only for kind of structural engineering or particular types of engineering. And I'm sure if you go around today, there's gonna be loads of different things that you can do. So that's it from me. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions, hopefully. So yeah, if you put your hand up, then we'll have a mic brought round to you. Any questions at all? Any I'll questions start picking on you if you don't ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Do you work with um, environmental engineering as well? Is it just like, so how does it fit in with environmental engineering? Yeah, very closely. So every time we're designing a building, it's really important that all the materials that we're using and so on, the concrete and the steel, is environmentally friendly. So we work with environmental engineers. The environmental engineers might also go into the site before we start work to check if there's contamination, to check how the water is and so on. So we all work in a massive team together. You can't put a building or a bridge up without about 20 different types of consultants and engineers working together. What's the salary like? Aha. Uh -huh. um, I think you can make pretty good money. So you're never going to make as much money as a lawyer or a banker. But you're probably never going to work as many hours as them. So my husband is an investment banker and I see him for a few hours on the weekend and that's it. He works 90 hour weeks. So that's, you know, we have to think about that a little bit. So I think engineers get paid really well for the time we put in. I do 9 to 6, 6.30 on average. That's pretty much it. I have a life. I have hobbies and so on. But I think for that, it's a really well-paid profession. Any more questions at all? Yeah, far corner. Do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> so you know how you said you could do the um, three-year degree in physics and then you did like one year in engineering? Could you do the same with maths and then go into engineering? Oh, there and back. Um, 
It's slightly more unusual, but I think it's possible. So when I did my physics degree, I had no idea I was going to change to engineering later. So all I had to do was kind of go around and speak to some of the university departments and say, this is what I'm interested in. Is this something I can do? And actually, they said to me, if you're good at maths, then you can become an engineer. And so I see no reason why you can't do that. You might need to be, it might be a little bit harder. I found the masters quite tough because I was the only one there without an engineering degree. But I got through it and it was all possible, got a job. So I'd, I'd do a little bit of research and talk to some people and find out how that is. So Any more? Any more questions at all? No? Okay, uh, well, thank you very, very much. Awesome. Let's have a round of applause for Roma then. Thank you.